Genesis chapter 13, Genesis chapter 13 tonight, Genesis chapter number 13, I'm going to begin reading in verse number 1, I know that we looked at verses 1, 2, 3, and 4 last Wednesday evening in our Bible study, but I want to read from verses 1 of chapter 13 all the way to verse number 12, I'm going to read those 12 verses tonight before we pray and, and have, our, have our seat and get into our study tonight verse 1 of chapter 13 and Abram went up out of Egypt he and his wife and all that he had and lot with him into the south and Abram was very rich in cattle in silver and in gold and he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been at the beginning between Bethel and Hai Verse 4, and to the place of the altar, which he had made there at the first, and there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also, which went with Abram, had flocks and herds and tents. And the land was not able to bear them, that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And the Canaanite and the Pezzarites dwelled then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren. Verse 9, Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and behold all the plain of Jordan or beheld all the plain of Jordan, I should say, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zorah. Then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves the one from the other. Verse 12, Abram dwelled in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain and pitched his tent towards Sodom. I appreciate you always allowing me the opportunity to step back uh, a few verses sometimes, and even a chapter or two back, so that we can refresh your memory. I know a lot of things goes on, goes on from Wednesday to Wednesday, and so I appreciate you letting me do that tonight. And I, I want to say uh, and refresh your memory concerning about Abraham in chapter Uh, number 12, and we looked last week of how that Abraham left his altar. Uh, We know that in verse number 6 and 7 and 8, Abraham built an altar unto the Lord, and he prayed unto the Lord. He called upon the name of the Lord, and Abraham is serving the Lord. He's trusting the Lord. He's abiding close by the Lord's side there. He's walking with God. And then, of course, we know that there was something that pulled him away from the altar, we talked much about that last, last Wednesday evening. And we saw that what pulled him from the altar was a famine. But more specifically, it was a trouble. Troubles pulled him away from his altar or pulled him away in his relationship with his God. And we saw how that Abraham began to uh, go from having the upward look, as I called it last Wednesday night, to having the outward look. Instead of keeping his eyes upon the problem solver, he began in the latter part of chapter 12 to keep his eyes upon upon the problems. And because of that, uh, we we took note of how Abram in verse 10 went down and how his attitude went down, his spiritual temperature went down, and he went down to where he shouldn't have went, down to Egypt. God never instructed him to go to Egypt. Even though there was a famine, God was well able to take care of Abraham even in the worst condition. But Abraham doubted his God, and, and so he, he left the place of obedience, and he disobeyed God, and he didn't trust his God anymore, and he went down and thought the world could take care of his needs. And sometimes we as Christians, the very first thing we'll do is that we'll run down to mama or daddy or down to the boss man or down to the bank or down to the finance company instead of spending time in prayer about it. Amen. God can still supply all our needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus, and there's no interest involved either, amen. 
And so God was well able to take care of Abraham, but Abraham kind of got away from that as you and I do at times. And so we know that when he got away from his altar, that some bad things happened. The first thing, he, he began to uh, be deceptive about his wife and said, you tell Pharaoh and his servants and the people of Egypt that you're my sister. And of course, lying is a sin. And uh, I know that uh, at times we think lying gets us out of trouble, but it always gets us in more trouble. And you know this as well as I do. You have to tell another lie to get out of that lie, and then another lie to get out of that lie, and then you've got all kind of lies that you're living. And so he tried to deceive Pharaoh, in which he did. And he did deceive this king, but he did not deceive the king of kings. God knew all about it. And so we, know, we, we read how God plagued Pharaoh, and, 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 and Pharaoh found out in a hurry, leave this woman alone, leave Sarah alone. She's a married woman. She is married to Abraham, and God has touched Abraham. God has, has promised, he has promised to bless Abraham and his seed, and that seed was going to come through Sarah. So that meant, Pharaoh, you can't have Sarah. She belongs to Abraham, and she belongs to me. And I was talking, uh, Brian and Carrie come by, and I'm, I'm glad that they're planning to get married in September, and they came by and seen me Monday and spent some time with me, and, and of course they asked me if I'd marry them, and we talked, and, and one thing that I stress with whoever uh, they allow me to be part of their uh, marriage ceremony, I, I say, listen, it, marriage is, is not two, it's three. And if the Lord's not in the center of your marriage, of your home, it, it won't work. It won't be as beautiful as God has intended it to be. And so that's the way it was, I believe, here when Abraham and Sarah and their relationship, their marriage, God had to be the center of it. And so God says, Pharaoh, says, Pharaoh, you can't have her. I've got great plans for Abram and Sarah. And so we see that in chapter 13, we, uh, we begin to see that because all these troubles that uh, that he had, that he was forced to leave Egypt. And we talked a little bit about troubles, and I ended last Wednesday night talking about there, only, there is only two uh, real reactions or two real ways that we deal with troubles. And we looked in Genesis chapter number 42, in which the scripture says, uh, all things are against me. And then we flipped over to Romans chapter number 8 to see the second attitude towards our troubles, and that is all things are working for me. So we can either feel that all things are against me, have a negative attitude about our troubles, think that the world's falling apart, thinking that, that God can't answer and God won't work on our behalf, or we can have the attitude that is found in Romans chapter 8, 28, all things are working for me. All things are not good, but all things are working for me. And that's the attitude that God wants us to have about our troubles. I mean, he's God, he's changed not, and he can handle any heartache, any disappointment, any trial, any suffering, any tribulation, any tears we shed. He can wipe every tear we ever shed. Amen. And so we need to have the attitude, not all things are against me, but praise the Lord, all things are working for me. God is doing a work in our life when the troubles come in our life. Now, I just want to uh, share something and go back to the the first two or three verses here of chapter 13 before I jump into verse number 5. And I want you to see something with me. The Lord showed this to me today as I was sitting around the dining room table and the children were outside playing. And so I, I stayed close where I can look out the window. And I, I, I saw that in chapter 13, you know, the Bible uh, talks about how Abram was going down to Egypt. And it resulted in two things. And we're going to see one of those results here just in a moment. But him going down to Egypt led to two troubles that would hit him hard down the road of his life. Yeah. Two troubles, and this is very interesting, very interesting. The Lord showed this to me today. Two troubles that uh, Abraham had to, had to uh, deal with, had to be involved with, had to go through because he made the decision to go down to Egypt. We talked about the word down, how he went down to where God told him not to go. Egypt is a picture of the world in the Bible. Over and over, you can see, see a very clear picture that Egypt is a picture of, of the heathen nation, of the heathen people, of, and, and of, of the world. And so two things happened. The first thing that happened was, and this is very interesting, is that 
uh, the first trouble was worldly wealth. Worldly wealth. Now, I want you to see this. We, we know Abraham was promised to be wealthy. God had promised Abraham, I'm going to bless you. I'm going to bless your seed. I'm going to bless you beyond measure. But the blessings would come from the storehouse of God and not from the storehouse of Pharaoh. When God made that promise, I'll bless you. Your seed will prosper like no other seed in all the world. And, and there's, there are material blessings, and they were mainly a spiritual blessing, but there were material blessings involved. But God, God intended and planned that Abraham would be blessed, but those blessings would come from the, his storehouse and not the storehouse of Pharaoh. Now, I want you to notice with me, back up to chapter number 12, chapter number 12, and let's look at verse number 5. I'm going to read this and share something with you. Very interesting. The first problem or trouble that Abraham began to deal with, and he dealt with it for a while, was, was when he went down in Egypt, he got worldly wealth. Look at verse 5 of chapter 12. And Abram took Sarah. Now, Abram is heading to Canaan. He's obeying the Lord. We notice verse 6, 7, 8, uh, and 9, he's, he's praying, he's living for the Lord. So is verse 5. He's living right. He's doing right. So Abram took Sarah his wife and Lot his brother's son, and watch this, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls or the servants, whether they be maid servants, handmaids, whatever they were, servants that they had gotten in Haran, and they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Now, the reason I read that verse is because in chapter 12 and verse 5, prior to Abraham going down to Egypt, Abraham was already blessed by God. Abraham, can you not see that clearly in verse 5? He's already blessed by God. God is already starting, and I don't know how, many, how, how much. I know he, God continues to bless Abraham as we go through the, uh, these chapters, and we'll see this down in the next uh, few uh, studies. But uh, God is already beginning to bless Abraham. Abraham's already been prosperous by obeying God and doing right. Now, I'm not here tonight to preach health and wealth gospel. Some of the most godly people I know uh, live in small houses and don't have a whole lot of money. Uh, but they got a whole lot of Jesus. And they, they love to sing the song, I'd rather have Jesus than worldwide fame. I'd rather have Jesus than houses and lands. And so Abraham is already blessed of God. But notice something about this. These blessings that Abraham has in verse 5 of chapter 12, who did they come from? They come from God. You, you, you won't read where they came from a king. Now listen to me. This is good stuff tonight. They didn't come from a man. They came from God. Now watch this now. When you get to chapter 12 and you go up, jump down to verse 16, Watch verse 16, read with me. And he, talking about Pharaoh, entreated Abraham or Abram well for her sake. And he had sheep. Look, look at the gifts. Look at the worldly wealth. He gave them sheep. He gave them oxes. He gave them he asses and mid service and maid service and she asses and camels. So chapter 12, verse 5, you see the blessings that came from the storehouse of God. Chapter 12, verse 16, you see the blessings that came from the storehouse of Pharaoh. Now, God didn't bless Abraham in Egypt, did he? he didn't, God didn't bless, why? Because he was living in disobedience. God will never bless us when we're not doing right. So who blessed him? The world did. I'm amazed as Christians when we decide to get away from God and do wrong and get away from our Bible and, and act like the world and act like we used to act, then the world starts to befriend us. There's something there. In chapter 12, verse 5, he's serving the Lord. God blesses him. The blessings come from the storehouse of God. But now he's away from God later in this chapter. He's in Egypt where he should have never been. 
And now God's nowhere to be found. God's not touching them. God's not blessing them because Abraham's not doing right. Who's blessing him? The world is. You'll have the world's blessing on you, Christian, if you'll just live the way they live. If you'll just get away from that high spiritual horse you're riding and just cuss a little bit, tell a dirty joke once in a while, and act like them. They don't feel convicted when you act like that. But when you live for the Lord and you go to church and read your Bible, you pray over your dinner and you do things that are right, there's conviction involved in their heart. You don't have their blessing then. But when you don't, they're just like Pharaoh. They'll befriend you. They'll bless you. They'll call you buddy again. Instead of moron, now you're their best friend. Instead of an idiot, instead of a nut for Jesus, now, boy, you're all right. You did the right thing. Isn't that amazing how that worked? God didn't bless. These blessings that, got, that Abraham found in Egypt didn't come from God. They came from the world. They came from Pharaoh. Now, I, I, this is wonderful. Notice that the blessings that God gave to Abraham in verse 5, they were, they were just right. They were just perfect for Abraham. I, I believe the Bible says that he'll supply all our needs. In other words, he'll get you He'll give you what you need. And then the Bible also says He'll give you the desires of your heart if you live right. So He'll not only give you every day I pray, so Lord, thank you for supplying my need. Don't have any doubt you're going to do it. But Lord, I also want to thank you for giving me some of my wants, some of my desires. You know, he didn't have to do that. You've got some of the desires right now you know God gave you. You didn't, you didn't have to have those. You could have just lived off your needs. But God's a wonderful God, isn't He? I'm a father to my children. I give them their needs. But, you know, once in a while I like to give them some of their wants. Amen. And, uh, and I, I'm glad for we have a father like that. But what God gives them in verse 5 is perfect. And I noticed something about this. The blessings that God gave Abraham in verse 5, you never hear about any strife. You never hear about any fighting over it. But when you get over here and see what the world gave Abraham, then we'll begin to see some strife. Right. That, hey, it cost him something going down in Egypt. Yeah, he got worldly wealth, but he's fixing to go through one of the most disappointing times in his life. And there's going to be two instances we're going to read in verse, chapter 13 and chapter 14 because of the worldly wealth that him and Lot received in Egypt, the world. Uh, Abraham had to go through some heartaches. And so I thought about that. It is after they received the worldly wealth that Abraham and Lot and the herdmen begin to have strife one with another. There, do you understand that tonight? Well, God showed that to me so clearly. When God gave it to them, when it came from God, when he was doing right, it was just right. But when they were doing wrong and the world blessed them, it caused troubles. Amen. I believe if you try to get riches and wealth uh, Without God in your life, it's going to cause troubles. Uh, but, you know, those that try to live right and do right, hey, there's, there, there were rich Christians in the Bible. There's some people today that are rich that, are, that love the Lord like you do. We get this idea because they got a Rolls Royce or a Jaguar that they don't love God. they got to be worldly. they got to be a gambler. they got to be. They gamble on horse racing all the time. I know they do. I know they cheated all their life. Look at what they drive. Look at that big old house. You know, and I know that the Bible says it's hard for a rich man to enter into heaven uh, because they, their God is their riches. But there are some people in the Bible and some people that I know of today that love the Lord and they're rich. I mean, they're wealthy, right? They don't have, they don't have you know. Right? And if they come to our church, if, we, if, if you see someone that, uh, if, if because someone gets a new car, you know what my salary is. And you know, and my wife don't draw a whole lot either. About everything she goes, goes to bills. And uh, and also, boy, the preacher somewhere. What's he doing? He, I don't know what he's doing. He's taking a twenty in his pocket every once in a while from the offering plate. What he's doing? The preacher's got a new car because he's been smart. You don't have to amen that because I'm not bragging. I'm telling you the truth. But when people get a new car, don't think, well, look at there. They ain't living for God. If they're living for God, they'd drive an old junk piece of car up in the driveway. Yeah, they're, they're, they'd be content with such things they have. Oh, God, help us not to have a condescending attitude when folks do well in life. If God blesses them, the Bible says that uh, when folks are exalted, we're supposed to rejoice. 
We're supposed to clap for them. We're supposed to say, good job. Hallelujah. I'm so happy for you. Amen. Amen. We're not supposed to say, no, we're supposed to say, hey, that's great. You know, that's great. Praise the Lord. Glad the Lord blessed you. But when Abraham was blessed by the world, it caused troubles. Now, watch this now. God was going to make Abram great. God was going to make Abram prosperous. But God wasn't going to allow Pharaoh to do it. God wasn't going to allow Pharaoh to be his agent in this thing. Now, wonder why God did that. Well, it's very simple. Because God wants all the glory. God wants all the praise. God would not share his glory. God will not and, 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 and did not back this in the days of Abraham and will not in our life share the praise or the thanks with the world. Amen. God was going to use Abraham in a great way. He says, Abraham, I'll bless you. I'll take care of you. And when God was blessing him, when he was living right and doing right, living in obedience and doing the will of God, there was no problems with the riches. But then whenever he got away from God and the world butted up to Abraham and said, oh, you're okay, guy. I'll take back all the things I said about you. I'll take it back. Say, you're a holy nut. I'll take it back. You're an okay, guy. Then the world began to befriend him and bless him. But those worldly riches caused trouble in his life. And we're going to see that here in a few moments. But I'd like to share something with you. It's interesting to me that Abraham learned his lesson. The next time a king tried to bless Abraham, I want you to notice what Abraham told him. Look in Genesis chapter 14. Now, I know we'll study this chapter in, in maybe in the next two or three Wednesday nights, but Genesis 14, and I want to show you what Abraham learned. Abraham learned in a hurry. We're going to deal with what a, the lesson Abraham had to learn and how God had to teach this lesson Abraham. But Abraham learned that God will bless me. God wants to bless me. God wants to do it through his storehouse and his goodness because he wants the glory. So in chapter number 14, verse 18, Abraham is, is leading his servants into a battle here. Some of the kings are fighting here, and, and Abraham, of course, we know that Lot was took captive. And, of course, the Bible says that Abram, in verse 13, came down there, and, and he began to whoop up on the enemy. Look at verse number 18. After the battle, the Bible says, Meshazadak, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine. He was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him. Meshazadak blessed Abraham and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. And blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. Now, that type of blessing is nothing wrong with it. That's a verbal blessing. He is blessing him as a, as a minister and as a priest of God. And then he blesses God, uh, Meshazadak does. He's not only a king, but he was a priest. He's a picture of Jesus Christ. He is a king and he is the priest, the, the great high priest. But, and then the Bible says, and, and we're in verse number um, uh, 20, and he gave him tithes of all. That's Abraham. Abraham gave tithes, gave tithes of what the spoil was from the enemy. Now watch this now, verse 21. And the king of Sodom said unto Abram, now Sodom and Gomorrah is just as worldly as Egypt is. Here's one of these worldly riches things again. Did Abraham learn his lesson? Well, let's see. And Abram and, and the king of Sodom said, Sodom said, Abram, give me the persons and watch this, and take the goods to thyself. And Abram did likewise and took the goods and prospered under the hand of the king of Sodom. Is that in your verse? That's not in mine either. That's, that's leology. That's some of the funny Bibles I've seen down at the bookstore today. That's what the funny Bibles say. No, that, here's what it says. And Abram said, verse 22, to the king of Sodom, I have lifted up my hand unto the Lord, the Most High God, the possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take from a thread, even a shoe lacet, uh, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abram rich. Abraham learned his lesson. See, 
Abraham learned, and we're going to look at the lesson, the hard lesson he learned because of the worldly riches of the, uh, of king, of the Pharaoh of Egypt. It may have been that Pharaoh told the world, they said, well, what about old Abraham? And Pharaoh said, yeah, I made him rich. I made him the man he is today. Boy, Abraham realized Pharaoh's getting all the glory and not my God. So the very next time a king shows up, the blessed Abraham says, I'm going to make you rich. I'm going to bless you. Abraham says, not so. I've learned my lesson. I had some strife between me and my nephew that I love so much between his Herman and my Herman, and it caused some problem between us. You'll not do it. I'll not take even a shoelace. I don't even take it. Because you're not going to say down the road when someone says, look at Abraham. Look at his descendants. And you'll rise up the king of Sodom and says, yeah, I made him who he is. No, oh, God wants the glory for what, what any good comes out of our life. Okay? Isn't that wonderful? I thought that was very interesting. Uh, that he learned from what he what happened in chapter number twelve. Well, so what did happen in chapter number or chapter number thirteen? I should say what what happened in chapter number thirteen. I read these scriptures. It's been a few months ago, and many of you may remember me dealing with this same subject. But I'm not going to skip the chapter because uh, I, I preached down this line before. I'm going to uh, share some things that I may have said, but some things are worth repeating. And this thing when we talk about strife. And the sin of strife is worth repeating to, to, for our ears tonight. Now, notice in verse 5, and it says, Lot also, which went with Abram, chapter 13, had flocks and herds and tents. Lot was blessed, not only of God, but he got some worldly riches down there too. And we're going to find out that it went beyond Lot getting worldly wealth, but worldly wealth got Lot. And there's a difference. Nothing, went wrong, nothing at all wrong with having things. The problem is, is when those things have you. Okay? When they have you. And when they take the place of your Lord and your God. And so the Bible says that, And the Lamb was not able to bear them, and that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, or their riches, their wealth, so that they could not dwell together. And there was a strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite, and the Perizzites dwelt then in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, Let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen. For we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take the left hand, then I will go to the right. If thou depart to the right hand, then I will go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes, and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, we talked about how that Abram went down to Egypt. Lot went down there with him. And we, we looked at chapter 13, verse 1, how that Abram now went up out of Egypt. I thought that was very interesting, the way the Bible, the King James Bible, how God ordained for it to read. Abram went up out. He went up out. And I thought about how that... Uh, Abraham is doing the up out. And I thought about how there's a lot of Christians today that need to get serious and, and start doing the up out. Get up and get out. A lot of folks in the world, they're hanging on to the world. They need to get up and get out. So the preacher is dancing in the Bible. I guess this is some kind of form of dancing. Get up and get out. Hallelujah. Get on up and get on out. All right. See, uh, George Jefferson moved up, but he never did move out. Amen. But the Lord wants us to move up and move out. Get up. Because Egypt went was down, and now he's going up. He's getting back with, to God. He's getting back where he needs to get. And so we need to get up and get out of Egypt. Then the second thing, look what it says. It says, and all that he had. I underline that word all. Everything Abraham had, he took it out. He said, I'm leaving here. I'm not leaving my wife. I'm not leaving my nephew. I'm not leaving any of my servants. I'm, leaving, I'm taking everything out. I'm getting, I'm getting out of here. And I thought that word all. How you and I need to understand it's a picture of being 100% surrendered to the work of God. Just get out of the world. Come out from among them. You're 100%. Get out of the world and the things of, the, things of this world. 
And then the Bible says that when he did that, that Lot went with him. I believe the third thing in that one verse is not only do we need to make sure that we've got up and out of Egypt, up and out of this world, number two, we better make sure all of us is out. You know, there's a lot of people leave the world, they get back in church, but their heart is still in the world. Come on now, you can help me tonight. It won't hurt you to amen once in a while. Their heart is still in the world. But Abraham said, I'm taking everything with me, my heart, my mind, my soul. It's all gone. I'm not going to leave my heart down there. And so, or, or anything like that. And so when he did that, guess what? Same thing will happen when we decide to do right and live for the Lord. We'll influence other people to do the same thing. Abraham did it. Thank God Lot went with him. I, I believe with all my heart. I believe with all my heart. With studying this chapter, I believe with all my heart that if Abraham would have never left Egypt, Lot would have never done the same. Lot would have still been there today. But Abraham got up and Lot followed. We've got to understand people are watching us. And when we do right, you said nobody cares about what I do for the Lord. Oh, yeah, there's people watching. Some of you that think that, that you're a nobody in this church, you think you don't do anything, you, 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 just, you just go to church, you, you, you might be amazed who in this church watches you and really does admire you and really is affected by what you do or what you don't do. So we need to influence folks in the right way. Amen? Oh, man. Okay, so he's, he's getting up and getting out of the world. And there's strife that's going on in, in their lives now. There's a big hindrance going on. I want to look at the sin of strife. Notice in verse, six, verse 8, excuse me, verse 8. We're looking at the sin of strife. What was this hindrance that came between them? We know what caused this trouble. It was the worldly wealth the worldly riches that he should never have been down there to get anyway. If he'd never been down there, he'd never got this type of treasure, right? The treasure that is corrupt. And so they got strife now. There's contention there. You know what strife is? If you're married, you know what strife is. If you've got brothers and sisters, you know what strife is. If you've got an employee or you're an employer or employee, you know what strife is. You know what strife is. And, uh, and I'm not talking about being, being upset or angry. I'm talking about going a step farther and just keeping that, that between something that separates one, and one from another, just anger and continual anger and hatred towards one for another. You know, you can stand up for what's right, uh, but, uh, but that strife shouldn't be there. But this strife was here. The Bible says it's very clearly it was strife. And Abraham said, let there be no strife between us. We're brethren. He said, we're not only uncle and nephew and family, he said, but we are both promised by God to be blessed. We're part of the family of God. We've left the Ur of Chaldees and their heathen ways. We've left that way. We've left that lifestyle. We're living for God now. We're brethren in this thing. We're not only flesh and blood here, but we're also spiritual brethren. And so he, he, he says, I know we're rich. Lot, you're rich, but we don't need to have Strife between us. Wouldn't that be a great and a wonderful motto for our homes? A wonderful motto for our churches, for our businesses, and our marriages? Just simply, let there be no strife. Let there be no strife. Let there be no strife. My wife, when we first got married, she would quote this verse all the time. She would always say, if we had a disagreement, and... Uh, if we wouldn't see an eye to eye, uh, she would always say, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. And she'd bug the hound out of me to, to talk about it. And I want to talk about it and fix it. Well, we'd stay up half the night talking about it. And I sometimes I'd tell her, let's just go to bed and I wake up, I'll be better. I'll be all right. I'm tired. And I was tired. And she was determined that uh, don't let the sun go down on your wrath. But that ought to be the motto let there be no strife between us. And I thought about how they were rich, and, and, but there's some danger involved in being rich. The danger was that it can come between you and folks you love. How many people have you seen buried and they leave an inheritance to the children, now the children are just upset ones and they don't have anything to do with each other? How many times have you seen that? Or they just fight over it? And, 
And that's what's basically happened here with Abraham and Lot and the herdmen. They both have become rich and by God, but now they've got the riches of the world, Pharaoh's riches, and this causes trouble in their life. This causes real trouble in their life. And that strife gets between their relationship one with another. Uh, you know, the Bible says that strife always brings division. Always brings division. Uh, you can just uh, thank God for somebody, maybe in your family, in your church, and, and something small come up, and, and, and both of you think that you're right, and you may be right, but you're not right to keep strife in your heart. What, you know, what you're discussing, you may have the right, uh, the right answer for, and they may be wrong, but still, it doesn't make you right uh, to act like an idiot. Doesn't make us right to act like a fool. Strife always causes division. And, you know, one time, far as I know, Abraham and Lot and Lot's servants and Abraham's servants, they were in one accord. They was getting along. They'd have made Rodney King proud, amen. They was all getting along. No problems. What happened? They got away from God. They got away from what God told them to do. Go to Canaan. Don't go to Egypt. Well, there was a famine down there. You ever try to justify why you do wrong to God? Lord, I want you to forgive me for this, but Lord, this is the reason I did it. First of all, God already knows the reason you did it, and it's not because what you think it is. It's because you've got a sin nature. We're just wicked. I'm not trying to hurt your feelings. I said we. That, inclu that includes this old boy. We're wicked. And it just takes one day away from a prayer closet, one day away from a Bible reading, and we are really wicked. Amen. Boy, somebody looked wrong at you. You're going down the road, and they just look at you wrong. Boy, you ready to pull over and, and show what car rage is all about. You blow the horn, and, 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 and how you blow it, you're not saying an amazing grace how sweet the sound. No, you're given a different Morse code. Amen. And so I tell you what, we've got to be careful. Strife will build up in our heart. The Bible says that strife is, is devilish. You know what that means? That means strife is a characteristic of Satan himself. Uh, let's, uh, uh, if, if someone, if we were to say that someone was, let's say that we uh, see an adult come to our church and they're a middle-aged adult and boy, they're just all over the place. Let's say James, he's like that. He just, he's Tigger. He bounces off the wall. He's ready to go. I wish I had that much energy. And, but he is, you know what I say? I would say, I say, James is Alanish. He's Alanish. Because that's the way Alan is. And the Bible says that being, having strife makes you devilish. That means you're just like Satan. That's a scary thought, isn't it? I don't, I've been called the devil before. But I don't want to be the devil, do you? It's devilish. It's evil. It breaks things apart. It hurts relationships. It'll destroy a marriage. It'll destroy a friendship. It'll destroy a church. It'll destroy a home. And those friends that once were a blessing or those relationships that once were a blessing, now they're torn apart. They're broken. Do you have someone in your life like that? Is someone that you once, you, you just was blessed to spend time with them and enjoy that relationship but now you don't speak one to another why was it strife did it bust it up did it break it apart strife will destroy relationships it'll destroy relationships we got to learn to make peace the sin of strife now we've got to close the second thing i want you to see is not only the strife but notice the dealing the dealing with the sin of strife strife's got to be dealt with or it's going to destroy us the dealing. Abraham, you know, he is out of Egypt now. He is trying to live for God now. It was Abraham that noticed the sin. I'm amazed as closer you get to the light, the more you'll notice darkness. And as he's getting closer to Jesus Christ, to his God, he's spiritually maturing. In chapter 12 and 13, don't you think that Abraham 
is a super spiritual giant this time. He's not there yet. He's growing in the Lord. He's young in his faith. He's a great man, but he's still growing in the Lord. He's still growing towards God. But he had enough maturity to say, Hey, I don't want to have any strife with you, Lot. Our herdmen don't need it. Our servants don't need to be fighting one another. And so I want you to see uh, three things about dealing with strife and apply this to our lives. Each and every one of us needs to apply this to our lives. Dealing with strife. Number one, notice the opposition. The opposition against us when we deal with strife. We're talking about dealing with strife. Number one, the opposition against us when we deal with strife. Notice verse number eight, the wording there. Abram said in the lot, let there be no strife I pray thee between me and thee. This was not a little issue. This was a big issue. It was a major issue. I mean, it had gotten bad. It got so bad that Abraham is begging his own nephew. He says, I pray thee, I beg you, I beseech you with all my heart, let there be no strife between us and between our servants. I thought about how that Abraham... Probably being a man and knowing Lot was a man and knowing that their servants were men or made of flesh, men and women, he knew that the opposition in dealing with flesh would be their own selves. Their own selves would hinder them from dealing with it. They, we get this attitude, as I said a while ago, that we're right, this strong feeling, I'm right, you're wrong, you're going to crawl back to me, buddy, if you're going to get things right. But, uh, you don't have to say, man, I'm right. That's how we get sometimes. I'm right, you're wrong. You're going to crawl back to me and we'll get this thing right. I'm not going to them. They'll have to come to me. The Bible says that we should go to them if we think it is. And, and, it's, and sometimes it's not. Sometimes we blow things up or allow Satan to blow it up. But when we really know that it's strife between two people, the Bible says that there's going to be opposition. The flesh will rise up. That old carnal flesh will rise up and say, he really was your friend or he really loved you or she that had never happened they would have done got right with you can you believe that look at him over there talking to sister so and so now they're not your friend no more and they're going to act like they're somebody else's friend act like they're just miss goody two shoes yeah look over there that's what satan will tell you and your flesh will rise up and you say man i ain't going to go to church and i have to see that old hag See that old hag sitting over there acting like she's somebody spiritual. Preacher called her name and said, thank you. If the preacher really knew her, he wouldn't say thank you. He said, get out of here. I know, I know how we think. I know how we think. The opposition, we're talking about dealing with strife. The opposition that will, uh, that will hinder us, that will come in our lives, the opposition that uh, is against us when we deal with strife. He said, I pray thee. Abraham knew that this wasn't going to be an easy thing. If it was easy, if every time two people had friction or division, if it was easy, man, if it was easy, this church would be in continual revival. America wouldn't be where it would be spiritually today. The world, the rest of the world wouldn't be, you know, we wouldn't really need to come to church as much or read our Bible. We wouldn't really need hard preaching sometimes. We don't need the Holy Ghost to stomp our hearts once in a while if it was easy. But I'm telling you, dealing with stripes not easy. The flesh will rise up and say, they're wrong. Let them come to you. If you go to them, you know what they're going to think? They're going to say, ha ha, I knew it was you that was wrong. You have to be careful. Number two, not only the, uh, the opposition against us when we deal with strife, but notice number two, the rationalization the rationalization in dealing with strife. It is rational to deal with strife. It is right, the rationalization to deal with strife. And we're going to see two things here that proves that, is, that it is rational, the rationalization in dealing with strife. I believe the first thing that Abraham felt in his heart that he wanted this strife dealt with and the reason that we need to deal with strife is, number one, 
because of our relationship with God. Abraham, I don't know how many days this lasted, Brother Keith, but I, I do know that it lasted some time because strife just doesn't have, it just builds up. And I don't know how long it lasted, maybe a week, maybe six months. I don't know the time frame here, but I do know that strife was there. And I do know that I believe God began to deal with Abraham. said, Abraham, I told you I'd bless you, but I can't bless you when you're acting like this. I can't bless you when you and your own family member, your own flesh and blood are fighting. Can't do it. And he got thinking about God, how God called him out of the herb, Chaldees, out of the land of sin and, and he, heathenish ways. And he got thinking about how God already blessed them, how God spared them down in Egypt when he could have easily had his head taken off his shoulder because of Pharaoh desired his wife. He got thinking about those things, and he said, Man, I've got something good with my God. I believe I'll get this strife fixed. I tell you, you start thinking about what God's done for you and who He is in your life, you'll want to get right with God. I believe that it is rational to deal with strife. Why? Because of our relationship with our God. When you think of who He is and what He's done for us, it's just rational to deal with it. Would strive for any sin. Second thing I'll say about when we talk about the rationalization and dealing with strife, not only because of the because of his relationship with God, but number two, because of his testimony to others. Or because of our testimony to others. We have a testimony. It's either a bad one or a good one. Or it's it's uh, so so, preacher. I'm working on it, preacher. But I believe that's the second thing we need to see about the rationalization and dealing with strife, not only because of our relationship with God, but number two, because of our testimony to others. Notice verse 7 with me. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle. And watch this. God ordained that this be in there. It doesn't stop there. God said, I'll put this in there, Moses. And the Canaanite and the Perizzite, Perizzite, dwelled then in the land. The Canaanites and the Perizzites, they were wicked people. They were heathen people. You remember Canaan? The son of Ham? God cursed Canaan. Put a curse on him. His descendants were the Canaanites. These are worldly wicked people. Guess what? While they're fussing and fighting, the wolves are watching. And they're destroying their own testimony. Oh, my. I, I read uh, 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 J. Vernon McGee said one time, I was reading on uh, trouble, contention, and strife between people. He said that he, said that he wrote in his, one of his books that he, he would go, a lot of Sundays, go over to his, his aunt's house for Sunday dinner. He said one of his aunts was a Methodist, and the other one was a Presbyterian. Some say aunt, some say aunt. I don't make enough money to say aunt. I'll say aunt. But they went over to his aunt's house. One was a Methodist, one was a Presbyterian. He said, you know what we had about every Sunday? Rose Preacher. He said, he, that's what J. Vernon McGee said. He said, we had Rose Preacher. He said, both of my aunts would sit there at the table and they would talk about their preacher or what they didn't like or what they didn't like about the sermon or what, about what he needed to do more of or less of. He said, they would chew chew their pastors up. He said, it seemed like they wanted to outdo the other one. He said, the problem is, and this is sad, the problem is, he said, my uncle sat at the head of the table. He said, my uncle was a man that hardly ever said a word, and he would sit there and eat his meal, never say a word, but he listened to everything those ladies said. He said, did you know that they never got my uncle in church? And J. Vernon McGee said, I believe today my uncle's in hell because of my aunts running the preacher down and running people down, the God, God's people down. You better mark it down. Your testimony is important. Abraham said, wait a minute now. This thing's got to get fixed. Because number one, my relationship with God, he, he's so good to me. I need him more than I need anything. I, he can take all the riches and all the treasures away and all the blessings. Just give me God. I need God. And if I got strife and sin in my life, I can't have that relationship with God like I ought to have it, like I want to have it. They said, but not only that, but I look over here to the world. There's the Canaanites, and they're watching over there, and they're kind of 
kind of just whispering in the corner and saying, see the old Baptist rocked. They have their fussing. They're supposed to be godly people. They talk about their God, Jehovah, the God of the universe, but they ain't no different than we are. They just are fussing and fighting with each other. Abraham said, this has got to stop. He said, because of my testimony to the others that are looking. You've got to be careful. I'm not, I don't feel like we have this here. I hope, I'm, I hope that I'm so true. I hope, I hope this is so true. But as uh, far as I know, I don't, we don't have strife here with the members and the pastor or the pastor with the members. And I don't feel, and I know that uh, I'm a man. And I know that I'm not perfect. And I know that you, some folks think they are, and they always do the right thing, and they are always got a great attitude, and they're always chirpy. And going, Miss Rose says, uh, she said the other Sunday when I had something heavy on my heart, uh, Sunday was there. He's here tonight. She's in Indiana, so you pray for her. And uh, she said, she said, Pastor, I knew something wrong because you're always singing. You're always up. And Morgan told me today, she said, Daddy, why do you got to sing about everything? I make songs up. We'll go down the road and I'll just make them up. I love singing. I want to have a good spirit. I want to be rejoicing. I want to be ha happy. There's been enough things in my life that's going to knock me down. So I want to take advantage of the happy times. Amen. And so we need to, work, we need to look, notice that others are watching the testimony that others are looking at. And then last of all, notice this. We looked at the opposition. We're taught, number one, the sin of strife. Number two, dealing with the sin of strife. When we looked at dealing with the sin of strife, we looked at, we say this would be A, the opposition that is involved when we deal with strife. B, the rationalization uh, in dealing with strife. Just rational, why? Because of our relationship with God and because of our testimony to the world, to others. And then number three, look at the separation involved in dealing with strife. The separation. This is a good place to end. It's, it's time to end too. So I, this, God laid this on my heart. And, and I, I need to show this to you. The separation involved in dealing with strife. I'm going to make a statement. I made this a while ago, but I'm going to really em emphasize this statement. Strife brings division. Strife separates. But I want to say this. On the other hand, Separation is needed to deal with strife. Now, you say, what are you talking about, preacher? Hang in there. Go with me to verse 9. Abraham says, The lot is not the whole land before thee. Watch this. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. I'm dealing with C, the separation involved in dealing with strife. Sometimes the other party, you may decide that you're going to live for the Lord and you're going to do right, and you go to that person and you tell that person, I'm sorry, I don't want nothing between us. I said this or I did this, and I'm, I'm sorry. It's so easy to say I'm sorry, but it takes a real person under conviction to say, I'm sorry because this is what I did. I mean, you feel real dirty when you have to say it. That's why the Bible says when you go to pray and ask forgiveness for sins, you don't say, Lord, please forgive me my sins in Jesus' name, amen. That'd be easy. But the Bible says confess them. Tell God what you did wrong. Boy, that, have you been there? Telling God what you did wrong? That's tough. If God wants us to deal with him that way, likewise, he wants us to deal with each other that way. It's easy to say, I'm sorry. I've had people come to me and say, Pastor, I need to tell you I'm sorry. And they'll boo-hoo and thank the Lord. And I believe they had a broken heart. Then they'll leave. And I'm thinking, what are you sorry about? What did I do? What did you do? What happened? And man, I can't eat for three days trying to figure out what the devil happened. And then the, I, I don't want to do that way. I want to say I'm sorry because this is what I did. This, but preacher, if I tell them what I said or if I tell them what I thought, it may hurt our relationship. Your relationship's already hurt when you don't tell them. Just trust the Lord, do right, 
And God will bless that relationship. <laughs> and you know, you may, you may go to them and tell them what you've been thinking and you might find out they've been thinking the same thing about you. <laughs> you know, you won't feel so bad then. Well, we've got a mutual relationship, praise the Lord. But the separation, sometimes you just have to separate yourself, number one, from others. There's just times that you try to deal with people that you've got strife between them and yourself, and they, they're determined that they're not going to make it right. They're determined till the day they die, they're going to hate your guts. They're going to run you down. They're going to tell you off every chance they get. When everybody brings your name up, they're going to have a, a heyday talking trash. You've already went to them and said, brother, sister, mom, dad, brother, sister, in the flesh, employee, employer, whoever it is, I'm sorry. This is what I've done. And they may take that. It's like, let's say that I, 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 I say that uh, I use uh, Wendell. And I say, I say, Wendell, can I use you for example? Thank you. And, you know, I, let's say, it, it, we'll just make things up, because he, I love the sign. The, both sides is wonderful. I love it. One side says the rapture, true separation from church and state. I love that. Love it. But if I, uh, I've been going around talking. I said, maybe I'll talk to mine. Lord God, when will put some of the dumbest things on that sign. I'm the pastor here, and people are going to look and say, what a redneck church. Man, what? they got an uneducated, ignorant fellow messing with that sign out there. And then I pull up and said, Lord God, look, Angie, what's wrong with that sign? What's wrong with that man? And, I, and then the Lord, one day, Wendell stands up in church and says, I just want to thank the Lord that God's using me. I don't thank the Lord that God's allowed me to, I'm not a preacher, but he lets me preach on that sign. And, and, Preacher, you'll never know what that means to me to entrust me with that. Oh, God. I'm sitting up there like a dog. I'm like, oh, God, I can't believe all stuff. And he's thanking me. And so God says, you're going to have to get it right, son. So I pull Wendell aside and I say, Wendell, I need to talk to you. Go ahead, Pastor. Wendell, I uh, owe you an apology. Really? What'd you do? I was hoping you wouldn't ask me what I did. Since you're nosy, I'll tell you. When I've been talking bad about you about the sign, I said you were ignorant and that what you were doing was was shaming me and was an embarrassment to our church. And I'm sorry, I apologize. I've realized that through your testimony that you enjoy doing it. God's God's blessed your heart doing it. I appreciate it, Wendell. Sorry. Then just like that, a light goes off in Wendell's mind. The devil says, <laughs> You've been coming out here and working and sometimes in the cold and the rain and the heat and putting up on words on them signs. And the whole time the preacher has not appreciated one time. He's not been thankful for you one time. And when he goes home and why, when he gets in the driver's side, Satan gets in the passenger's side. And they ride down the road and Satan begins to talk to Wendell. And I hope nobody rides home with Wendell tonight. Including Satan. And Satan began, said, what do you think about it? And the more he thinks about it, the matter he gets. Man, I can take my tithes, I can take my faithfulness and go somewhere else where I'm appreciated. Satan said, you're right. And boy, they begin to talk one to another. And it ain't getting good. And so Wendell decides, well, you know what? I'm going to stay. I'm gonna stay. He ain't going to run me. I'm going to stay right there. It's my church too. I'm staying there. But I tell you what. I'm going to hate his guts till the end. But if I know in my heart that I got, that I got right with God and I went to will and tried to make it right, you know, it may come to a time where I have to separate myself from Wendell. Abraham said this. He said, we need to separate one from another. That's a sad place to get to. So let's separate one from another. But I believe it not only sometimes requires separation from others, but number two... It requires a separation from our own selves. Uh, both of them are the letter O. Separation that's involved in dealing with strife. Sometimes we have to separate from others. But sometimes, God showed me this to me. This to me. Watch this. We have to separate from our own 
self. Watch the wording there with me in closing. Verse 9, separate thyself from me. I looked at that and God said, you know, not only is there a message there that Abraham is separating from Lot, but there's, a diff there's another separation that you need to speak about tonight, and that is separation from our own self. You know why we have strife? Because we're full of self. We're full of sinful, fleshy, carnal self. And we need to separate from self. Separate from me. You see that wording in there? Separate from me. Sometimes I just need to separate from my own self. I need to go somewhere where the altar is, the prayer closet, the back deck, out in the woods, wherever it is, and just separate myself. Say, God, I need to get right with you. This is all my fault. I'm making it bigger than what it is. It's not that big of an issue, and I'm, I'm acting like an idiot. I'm hurting my relationship with you. I'm hurting my relationship with that brother, that sister, that family member. I'm hurting my relationship, my testimony with the world. Everybody at my job knows that I hate this person because I talk about him all the time. They know I don't like my preacher because I talk about him. My kids know it because while we eat dinner, we talk about the preacher. We need to separate from our own self. Amen. Separate from our own self. Sometimes we're just too much of ourselves, aren't we? God help us to separate. The separation involved in dealing with strife. Get right with God. Amen. Amen. Quit living after the flesh. Quit living after self. Live after the spirit. And the Spirit will never, never ask you to go fight somebody, to talk trash about somebody, to hurt somebody. He'll never do that. Never do that. Thank you so much for listening to the sermon today. We hope and pray that you know the Lord Jesus Christ is your personal Savior. The Bible says in the Gospel of John, chapter 3, verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The Bible says in John chapter number 14 that Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Our prayer here at Open Door Baptist Church is that you know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The Bible says that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, Jesus Christ loves you. He died for you. And He's more than capable and more than willing to cleanse you from unrighteousness and from your sins and make you a child of the King of kings and the Lord of lords. The Bible says if you repent, turn from your sin and turn to Jesus Christ and by faith believe in His death, His burial, and His resurrection for your salvation, you too can be saved. Our prayer is that you think upon this and that very soon you'll make an eternal decision to receive Jesus as your personal Savior. Thank you so much.